My name is Cece. I'm president of NAACP here on campus. And me and my e-board put together a presentation before we go on to talk about are we still perpetuating um, rape culture in 2018. So first I'm going to introduce um, my e-board to y'all and then we can go into introducing the panelists. And then we can go into the presentation. Afterwards, we're going to ask the panelists some questions. So we can start this way. Yeah, you can go ahead and stand up. Hi, my name is Mia Harris, and I'm the third vice president of NAACP. Hi, I'm Kiana Alton. I'm second vice president of NAACP. Hi, my name is Tamai Farsky. I'm second secretary of NAACP. Hi, my name is Kendi Ojo. I'm the first vice president of NAACP. Hi, everyone. I'm the chapter advisor of NAACP. Uh, hi everybody, I'm Gabriel Pimentel. I'm the Vice President for the State uh, NAACP Youth and College. Which is kind of different, but the same. So. Yeah, it's a part of my e-board, but by fault. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Femi's going to present to you guys the panelists. Okay. Hi, so this is our panelists for tonight. We have... We have uh, Professor Nawatni, he's a part of the CRIM department, he's <laughs> here today on a, oh, okay. We have Professor Jordan Nawatni, he's assistant professor in the criminology department. We have student uh, Julia Seaman, she is a student here, a freshman, sophomore, sophomore, sophomore student. And then we have, um, we have Taryn, he's a housing director. Assistant director. I'll get paid the money yet. And then we have counselor Jamie Lauren. We have graduate student Michelle Lara. We got it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have John Kowalski, he's assistant director. Oh no, not John. I wish. Neil. Yeah. Oh, we have Neil, sorry. No, Neil. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> And now we're going to start the presentation about are we still perpetuating rape culture in 2018? So, what is rape culture? Rape culture can be defined as an environment in which rape is prevalent and in which sexual violence against women is normalized and excused in the media and pop culture. The term rape culture was popularized by feminist writers and activists in the U.S. during the 1970s. It first appeared in, the, in print in the book Rape, the first source book for women, published in 1974, which was one of the first books to discuss rape from the standpoint of women's experiences. A film bearing the title Rape Culture premiered in 1975 and drew attention to how media and popular culture spread mainstream and erroneous beliefs about rape. Women at the time used this term to draw attention to the fact that rape and sexual violence were common crimes across the country, not rare or exceptional crimes committed by crazed or damaged individuals, as many have believed. It's important to distinguish the difference between rape and rape culture. So <coughs> rape is a crime, whereas um, rape culture is the social normalization of the actions of rape. Okay. <clears throat> so before we get started, could you please take a minute to look at the examples here? Actually, here. And if you could, give <coughs> me some reactions on what you're seeing, right? So Uh, well, the American Apparel one is pretty uh, pretty interesting. Um, don't worry, boards are supposed to be like this. Um, I know recently there's been uh, this sort of like this movement of certain individuals with certain mindsets that believe that uh, men are supposed to be a certain way and that, um, that they're just releasing their, their manly instincts. Um, um, the one that I 
one standing out to me the most is that Dulce and Gabbana one, where I think they're trying they're trying to express like like a type of like attraction sexually, but it looks more like they're kind of forcing themselves all on one woman. So. Okay. Yeah. The one that stands out to me is the one um, with the poster that says, "Don't worry, boys are supposed to be like this." Um, it kind of reminds me of like when people say uh, raise boys and girls the same way type thing, like when we say like boys, we like kind of dismiss how boys uh, act in a certain way. We let them get away with a lot of things that if girls did it, it wouldn't be okay or appropriate in any way or any manner. So I think that's kind of what stood out to me. Okay. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. oh. um, the one at the bottom where it says, that's actually interesting to me because, um, like, back in high school, they taught us to, like, look up, like, different cultures and stuff in like, different countries. And when you look up to, like, America, like, America, like, attire or whatever, like, literally you just see naked women. Mm -hmm. So it's very interesting because if you look somewhere like Nigeria, like, they have, like, raps and stuff like that. When you look for America, like, the women are completely naked. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's talk about... So the Dolce & Gabbana advertisement clearly shows men being dominant over the only lady in this advertisement. Also take note on how the men are oiled up and shirtless and notice how the woman's being restrained. So not only is this showing men being sexually dominant over this woman, but there's also a stereotype placed on men that they have to be this type of body like, in order to get that type of woman. Another example would be seen in American Apparel where one person is definitely has more power than the other, literally spreading the other person's legs wide open. Next are tweets that go back to the Steubenville High School rape case, where a 16-year-old girl was intoxicated and raped by her peers who recorded the acts and posted it on social media at the top. This is what some of the people had to say about the victim. Um, just a trigger warning to those that need it. Um, this is very... Wait, can I actually read it out loud? Because I can't see it over here. Yeah, but I, 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 I don't know. Oh, okay. 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 <laughs> um, and I quote Disgusting outcome on the hashtag stupid bill trial. Remember, kids, if you're drunk slash slutty at a party and embarrassed later, just say you got raped. Um, quote unquote. So you got drunk at a party and two people took advantage of you. That's not rape when you're just a loose drunk slut. Yikes. Um, another example that I'm pretty sure most of us have listened to would be Blurred Lines by Robin Thicke. If you take a look at the lyrics, you can literally see that this song talks about finding a gray area between consensual sex and rape, where this person is intoxicated. Um, and if this person is intoxicated, that is obviously a clear no, that they are not thinking clearly, even though you may think that they want it. Um, the last example is clearly make fun of rape. That's the, it's Belvedere Vodka, but there's no model there. Um, it literally needs no explanation. However, I will read the advertisement and says, unlike some people, Belvedere always goes down smoothly. Yes. <clears throat> now there's more examples of rape culture, but mine has various Ideas like some showing this uh, victim, sh some showing men as victims, some that don't look like rape culture, like the pizza box, and then just, and then some showing like females as victims as well. So the first ad I will be discussing is the Domino's ad, where the phrase is "No is the new yes." So on the box is showing, is basically normalizing the phrase "No is the new yes," and. The concept to this ad is just basically like, it just normalizes rape culture in society, but it also like interferes with children who are growing up and who are looking at dominoes and who are looking at the box and reading the slogan and just saying it anyhow in any way and not understanding that there's a deeper meaning, meaning to know is the new yes. Because then they're gonna, it just, it interferes with the development growing up because they could say to anyone saying, oh, no, it's the new yes, Domino said it. And then as they get older, that's the concept they follow and they go through. Uh, next ad is the male, bottom left, with the salad dressing. And in the small print, it mentions saying, it says, the only thing better than dressing is undressing. 
And with this ad, I just wanted to discuss how it's always mentioned that, oh, women are the victims, women are the only ones who are rape victims. But this one, it goes out to show that men can be victimized as well and that they could also be rape victims as well. And this also just shows how, like Kiana said in the last one, how this is how men are looked at. They're shirtless, they're oily, they're opened up. And the only thing better than dressing is undressed. And then the next ad is another American Apparel ad where the man is shoving his foot up the female's butt. And that one plays a role with rape culture. Very straightforward. Like, like, why? You're promoting clothes, but then you're showing the guy shoving the foot. I'm going to just be vulgar. He's shoving his foot up her ass. Like, how is that promoting the American Apparel, you know? And then the next one is the beer bottle ad. <laughs> it's pretty, it's, it's like they're, it's a man's, it's like they had different ways to visualize it, but it's promoted as basically a man's junk. But it's promoting beer bottle. I don't see the too much. And then in the bottom right is the, oh, and then the bottom right is the Calvin Klein ad, just like the last ad, just like the last one where it's, three men and you see the woman, she's very lifeless and she basically like, de like she's just very lifeless and not um, aware. She doesn't look aware of what's going on around her. She's dehumanized. She's dehumanized. I don't know if that's the word. So that's, this one is clear. It has three men and one woman. And then in the top is the Tom Ford for men. And with that concept, I, it promotes rape culture and the fact that it says time for for men, but then they put the perfume and a woman's private part. So for, for me, from my point of view, it was looking like women for men. So that was also like, you know, how can I say? That was also sexualizing, sexualizing women and basically putting women as property to men and men being the dominant. Um, there you go. Like all of these, they have a significant um, correlation. They're all sexualizing either the male or female and just kind of promoting um, a culture that isn't, that shouldn't be promoted. It should be more so that we're all kind of on like this equal cell or we should, I don't want to say like we have to be um, conservative when we like do like advertising and things like this because I mean, the naked body is a part of, you know, being a human, mm -hmm. but it doesn't have to be in such a way that's so dehumanizing and vulgar in a sense. And then, last ad, just, um, I think we touched on it the last slide, with don't worry, boys, boys are supposed to like this. And when I saw that ad, it gave, I took it as a sense of st they're stereotyping men as the aggressor and the dominant <coughs> and this post is basically like, how can I say? It's basically refuting that and saying in sarcastic tone, oh, yeah, all boys, we all like this, but it's just like not, it's not like that. It's like, it's, it's just not. I actually think that photo is from a thread of, of multiple men, and it's supposed to be quotes of what their rapists had said to them. The one where it says, um, "Don't don't worry, boys are supposed to like this." It, I think it's from a full thread w of what the rapist had said to them. Well, thank you for giving me that knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is all my examples. <coughs> um, this slide is a wall of posts, um, and this basically shows how um, rape culture is represented on um, social media platforms. Um, this can be through Instagram posts, through tweets, uh, through song lyrics, such as like where lines like was mentioned earlier, um, and also even through news outlets. Um, uh, Instagram posts and tweets often make jokes pertaining to rape culture as like a form of entertainment. So like as like people are scrolling down their timeline, they see posts uh, such as the one in the bottom corner here. Um, the example is, it says, you throw a party. Um, after everyone leaves, you see her passed out, drunk like this, what do you do? 
And in the comments, I know it's kind of hard to see, but in the comments, there's like, um, it's mostly guys that comment on it. And like, I know one of the comments says Bill Cosby her. Um, one of the comments says like, um, take a picture and say you had sex with her and post it. Like this, it's very degrading comments underneath post. Um, and obviously the form that she's in, she can't give consent to, you know, have sex or not have sex. Um, so that perpetrates rape culture. Um, also song lyrics such as the um, Blurred Lines, I know like when it first came out it was very popular, everyone was singing it and nobody probably actually um, took the time to understand the message that it was getting across to people. Um, and there's various other songs that um, perpetrate rape culture too. Another one in the top corner there is with Rick Ross. Um, I'm not sure of the song but I know the lyric, one of the lyrics is put Molly in her champagne. Um, sorry, I can't really see it. Put Molly in her champagne, she didn't even know it, and he took her back to the room and enjoyed that, and she didn't know it. So basically, <coughs> so basically saying like um, they had a drink or whatever, and he wants to take her back to her room and have sex with her, and she wouldn't even know. So things like that, it's like, it, it's mostly seen in like hip hop and R&B, but it's also in um, other songs as well. Uh, also, news reports, the way in which news outlets report rape, um, can be perpetrating rape culture too without um, us even taking note to it. Um, a lot of headlines, um, a lot of headlines when um, rape is being reported say like um, the men or the boys have like promising futures. Um, um, what is it? They have promising futures. I can't really see it. They make excuses kind of like for boys who are, you know, raping girls and they, um, don't really put as much emphasis on the victim um, as much as they should. So yeah, these are just cases of like everyday, you know, timelines, timeline things, tweets, um, and even having these outlets for J. Um, and even like beyond that, like uh, beyond just not even giving the victim a voice, they kind of make the victim feel blamed. They make her or make him feel like if they would have did something different, if they would have um, maybe dressed a little bit more appropriate, wasn't in this place at this time, then this and this would not happen. And I don't think that's the correct way to go about violence. Okay. Um, and now we're gonna have, actually I didn't get to introduce Demi, but Demi and Femi are going to ask questions to the panelists based on rape culture and their opinion in their own um, <coughs> field. Okay, hi, I'm Femi. This is my co-host, Demi. Hello, everybody. So, I'll turn on. So, first question we're going to ask the panelists. Um, what does rape culture mean to you, and how would you define it to someone who doesn't know what it is? Um, okay, I guess how I would define it is um, we're all socialized in a certain way uh, to believe certain things about who we are and how we're supposed to act um, and how we're supposed to act with each other. And so this is the infrastructure. Part of the infrastructure is based off of um, power, about individual power and social power. And uh, rape culture is embedded within a larger structure that um, people are very unequal. Um, if I get a chance to later, I want to just talk about um, uh, rape. We know is a is a a form of violence that's based around uh, power over somebody else. And we know that's been used in war. Uh, we know that's been used in households. Um, we know that the foundations of sexual assault and rape are built off of lots of things that we have created from a long time ago that we still do. Uh, patriarchy, uh, how we understand like masculinity. And lots of these things are embedded in things that we are part of and we're invested in. Things like sports, things like TV, things like our school systems. We're part of that. We create that. It's not just about um, the media, in my perspective. It's the most easy to talk about and discuss if we see it. but. Um, when, I was a, when I was younger, I was invested in it, right? Uh, I went to school and I bought things based off of gender identity and who I thought it was, and probably many of you have as well. And um, so rape culture is this big, big structure that um, we don't really talk about. Uh, so that's a complex answer. I'll give lots of other. 
I'm sorry, what was the question again? <laughs> uh, what did rape culture mean to you? How would you define it to someone else? To me, I'm going to be honest, it's disgusting. <laughs> Because the way I would describe it to other people is the normalization of rape and making other people think that it's okay. If someone means no, it means no. That doesn't mean try again later, or maybe they'll like if I do this. So in short, it's just making people think that any type of forced sexual contact is okay for men, women, whatever you identify as, whoever is raping whoever. If they say no, just you keep your distance and just leave it at that. Don't try again later. Um, I would say definitely for me, uh, rape culture is something that's kind of passed around from generations of uh, friend groups, the church, school, et cetera. Um, just really, solidify the norms around what's acceptable for men to do with women and vice versa. Um, and to put it in terms that you guys may understand too, rape culture to me, for example, when you see a guy commenting on a woman's body. So fellas, there's not that many fellas in here, but I'm sure you've seen somebody, a woman walk by and say, dag, she got a next body. That's an example of rape culture. Uh, unintentional, oh, un, um, Unconsensual dancing at parties, that's a part of race, rape culture also that people don't realize. When a um, woman walking by, somebody grabs your arm, hey, let me talk to you real quick, that's a part of it also. So it's small different things that I see from different perspectives. I'm pretty sure that they've said it better yeah. than I can. Um, but I have this amazing visual which I think would be really useful. I'm one of those people that always comes with things. <laughs> Resources, I'm a social worker by training, so I'm like, I have things! <laughs> um, from a clinical perspective, working with victims of assault and rape, you know, what I do regarding rape culture is deconstruction. We deconstruct these thoughts, these ideas, these beliefs. We have, you know, people who come in and say, I was in the wrong place at the wrong time. No. No, you weren't. So it's a lot of reframing things for people so they can see it through another lens. Because they're coming in with the social construction of rape culture and what their role is in that. And immediately, victims do what? What do they do? They blame. So I spend a lot of time reframing, deconstructing, and then rebuilding and helping them see the entire situation differently. Why do you think that is that um, victims tend to blame other people or blame like their outside factors other than like, or like they tend to blame themselves as well. Why do you think that blame is the first thing victims tend to do when they have traumatic experiences? Well, I think in this situation, I think part of it is we're socialized, you know, for women, we're socialized to believe that it is our responsibility to keep ourselves safe from rapists. Mm -hmm. And I mean, our mothers, I've had mothers who say, well, my daughter was wearing this thing and she was at a party, she was in the wrong place at the wrong time. It's like, no, she has every right to wear what she wants to wear. We put the blame on ourselves as if we have to do something differently <coughs> to stop people from raping. And the reality is, no, people just shouldn't rape. So I'm not sure what the psychological phenomenon is, but I think it's always easier to blame yourself, figure out, well, what did I do wrong, mm -hmm. instead of putting it out where the responsibility belongs. Thank you. So I would define rape culture as the trivialization of rape to the point where people are not really faced by it. And I think you did an excellent job of illustrating some examples of when a man grabs a woman's arm on the street he thinks that because he's attracted to that woman or because she dressed in a way that he found attractive or provocative, that he has the right to be aggressive with her to keep her there because of that attraction. And it's in a lot of subtle ways that we don't even realize. These ads do a great job of giving real clear examples of it, but it's, it's very underlying. It's, um, you know, it's when a coach smacks a player's ass, and that's totally normal and not even looked at, but that's totally inappropriate for someone to put their hands on your body because of you acting aggressively, you know? So I think it's it's very ingrained in a lot of the ways we interact that we don't even notice. Well, and I'm sorry I'm gonna jump in, but those slides before with the pictures, 
how many of us were even bothered by them, unless we were told to really look at them and analyze them? That is so normal for us to look at that stuff and be like, OK, move along. We're not even mostly affected by it. So I think it's just become so much a part of what we experience every single day. Sorry. I think engagement will be good in like this type of environment. We're very intimate here, so if anybody has questions that they want to ask the panelists, I think it'll be great if you guys just raise your hands. Yeah, at the end. Yeah, so I think to touch on what uh, Michelle was just talking about and what Jamie showed with um, the, the resource there, I definitely recommend checking out the resource um, if you haven't seen it. Uh, what it kind of looks like is a pyramid, right, with the, with the upper level of the pyramid being like actual rape, um, sexual assault. Um, but what's at the bottom rung of that is everyday normalized behaviors like um, like locker room talk or, or, or the notion that boys will be boys and, and the thought of that is that we normalize those behaviors. Those go unchecked and so we think those are okay. And so they escalate and not to make dominion of a really serious situation but the, the easiest um, parallel I've been able to draw to explaining this in, in easier terms is kind of the, the, the children's story, if you give them a mouse, it could be a wine glass of it, right? So we, we allow this uh, lower level behavior and it escalates and escalates and escalates, and that's when we have um, these sexual assault related behaviors. All right, so the next question is, um, when was the first time that you experienced or heard about something that pertains to rape culture? Uh, I mean, probably in college, um, maybe though not until grad school, to be honest. I don't think that my uh, college would once discuss this, um, and it just shows that we've come a long way to, to talking about it. I'm, I come from a small place, and we, we have obviously had this term develop in the 1970s, um, but where I came from, we didn't have discussions like this, so that's what I would say. I'm sure I experienced it a lot as a kid in middle school, but I wasn't properly educated to know that it was actually a thing. And I'm just like, oh, it's just people. In high school, though, I did start to notice it more because I was friends with a lot of guys in middle school. And then in high school, as they got older, they started acting very differently towards me and their other female peers. and. All I can think is, who told them that it was okay to say things like that? And I didn't really know that rape culture was a thing, so I ended up going home that night and looking into it to find out that it was just probably society telling them from a young age to say that stuff was okay. Because I'm sure, as we've all heard from little kids, he's only mean to you because he likes you. Mm -hmm. Um, for me, I learned after undergrad, um, I definitely came from a problematic background of everything. Um, it was when I became a professional working as a wrestling director in higher education. That's when I learned about rape culture. Um, I, in college, definitely everyone was guilty of getting women drunk and vice versa and whatnot. We didn't know any better. We thought, oh, that's how it's supposed to be. But you realize that after the fact, and when you think about it in the future, when you have more wisdom, like that could have been someone's daughter, that could be my daughter, that could be my mother, that could be whoever. So that's really what set it off for me and made me realize, oh, this is rape culture and I shouldn't be doing this. So that's something I learned. Can I ask you a quick question? So why do you think it is that men treat women in such a way even though they have they're usually surrounded by female presences like if you think about a lot of men today they're either raised by single parents typically being female or either just you know just surrounded by females on a general basis why do you think that it is that men um put these type of energies out towards women even though they are they have little sisters and they know better than or they try to raise their sisters in ways that protect them from men but they act that way towards other women well i speak more from an individual place and i don't want to generalize necessarily but for me i learned from living life i didn't have parents or family that told me about it because they weren't kind of uh woken up to that kind of behavior like that's not unacceptable 
So it was something for me where I had to evolve and learn and grow on my own and gain that knowledge to see that it was unacceptable behavior on my part. So that's how I learned about it. Okay. Can I add to that real quick? Um, also, the people that are around us reward, reward each other for it. So my friends would, they would reward each other for this. So You're men would get rewards for, for doing this to other men, women, gendering, sexualizing individuals, like the reward for it. And so they weigh out the rewards of the people that they care about the most, their peers, wherever their social group is. And just to be clear, you're talking about like an ego boost, right? Like, oh yeah, you're the man, you did that, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. so that's, yeah. that's what he means by rewards. Okay, thank you guys. I would like to jump in. Um, something that you said caught my interest. Uh, you said you didn't really realize the implications of your actions until you got a little older and you thought about you know, the women that are in your life. And um, I think for a lot of them, that's the first step if, if they're used to if they have that rape culture mentality, that first step is thinking about, well, you know, how would I feel about my sister, my daughter, my mother? And I think that may be in part because as children, boys are told to stuff their feelings down and they're not taught about the value of empathy and connecting emotionally. That's kind of stigmatized that boys shouldn't really do that. And I think empathizing with a person at the core is how you limit violence, especially sexual violence, and understanding that that's a person who is going to have consequences because of this choice that you're making without considering their consent and their feelings. And so I think that's why that bridge of my mother, my daughter, my sister has to kind of be there to be like, oh, well, yeah, I do care about those women and how they feel. And that kind of has to bridge the gap between how I feel and how the victim of the sexual assault would feel. And I think the way we, we treat young men and teenagers really, really, really affects that process. So yeah. men get so like hyper-masculine. Yeah. Definitely the programming conditioning is very in-depth and it takes a lot of work to rewire everything and relearn, <laughs> definitely. And having that hard conversation with yourself and looking at yourself is hard and people don't want to have that conflict with themselves. Mm -hmm. Their pride's in the way, the ego's in the way, so that's where it's really holds people back from looking at that area that they've been lacking in, definitely, so. Right. So it starts on a base level. Mm -hmm. Can you guys on that real quick? Mm -hmm. um, thinking, going back to the mother, daughter, sister thing, don't just think about it in that sense. sense. Think about it in your own sense. Think how would you feel if someone just came up to you and touched you and you didn't want them to, or they said something that you thought was rude or derogatory or offensive because you're not going to know how those other people feel. It, you're only really going to know for sure how you feel if someone does it to you. So think about it in that sense. We had um, one question from the crowd. Can we ask, can we get one question from the crowd mm -hmm. and then move on? Mm -hmm. um, am I allowed to put input or can I only ask sure. questions? So one belief that I have is that a lot of men have the idea where it comes from, you know, even in a household where you might have a single parent with a mother as the parent and maybe even a sister, mm -hmm. in that household you will still witness um, like the basic core of misogyny mm -hmm. in a household like that, um, where the man, where you would have sayings like, oh, the man of the household, even though that's the son, even though the son has no like higher power in the household, you will still use that term. Mm -hmm. And men are also used like within the world, um, you know, for example, when a man gets married, one would take the, the uh, last name of him, and all the kids in the household would have the father's last name. Um, that's also just the old, like the ultimate idea that the man also has more power, which is portrayed more in the media, so that when a man does something towards a woman, they're they're less looked like the man has more. When the man has more power, the woman is going to be seen as less as a less of a person. Mm -hmm. um, and ultimately, we have to change that in the world where the man does not. I, not seen as like as a, as like the patriarchal rule, I guess it's called, mm -hmm. um, where man has more power over the woman, just in general, or else the men will continue to do things like within the rape culture, because it's it's just like a general idea where they think it's okay because of just the way they're raised and taught. Right. You know, even so it's when just over decades and decades, it's become become like um, an innate thing that people don't really think about, and it's like in the foundation of just how we move or we maneuver throughout our lifestyles. Correct, and we're not really doing much to change that. Even right. even even people who are surrounded, even men like my age or even 25, are surrounded by women like 
family, it, they're still going to have that power or like that idealistic um, family household where they're told, you know, oh, you're the man or something like that. Just to say right. you're the man mm -hmm. is going to put power on that one person and they're going to think that they're better or they have a higher up position within that household or just in general in society. Thank you so much for that comment. All right, so let's just continue with these questions. Okay. Um, the next question to ask will be, how do we disconnect entertainment from reality and where do we draw the line? Sorry? Uh, I'll tell you one brief. Oh, you can step from the other yeah, side. Yeah, okay. um, that's fine. Uh, I personally really like my reality. I'm happy. Uh, for, for me, entertainment is my escape for that in some instances. And so, um, you know, your lived experience is so valuable. Why would you look to um, some form of entertainment from which to draw your values, right? Those are internal. Um, and, and while there are learned experiences there, um, I mean, as we've seen in some forms of entertainment, portray things out of line with at least my own personal beliefs, but you have the opportunity to decide that for yourselves. And so um, we're in this position where we can absorb so many um, overt and subliminal messages from forms of entertainment, um, but then ultimately the onus is on us to decide what we believe and what we value. Uh, so I did a little research leading up to this question about um, media and entertainment in regards to uh, rape myth. So, rape myth is a term used to describe an individual's perception that rape culture is correct in a way. Um, so that will be having beliefs such as uh, if a woman's dressing provocatively, she kind of deserves what comes, or believing that a man should be able to exert dominance over a woman, or that women like that. Um, so, the first article I found, they compared uh, the consumption of reality TV, sports and pornography, um, drama programs and sitcoms, and they rated um, acceptance of objectification of women. And they found that uh, reality TV, sports programming, and pornography was associated with greater acceptance of objectification of women, which in turn was associated with greater rape myth acceptance and more frequent acts of sexual deception. So it just shows that there is there is a lot of power in what we're watching. And um, it may not be that you know watching sports programming makes you someone who believes in greatness, but maybe that people who have those characteristics are more drawn to those types of things. So there's some relationship there. And I also found an article um, they showed participants either an SBU clip um, with sexual assault of a woman, with uh, violence toward a woman, or just a neutral clip that had no acts of aggression. And they found that those who watched the sexual violence clip and nonviolent clips exhibited significantly lower scores on the rape myth scale than those who watched the physical violence clip toward women. So I thought this was really interesting that watching that sexual violence was low was a lower score than if you witnessed uh, physical aggression. So they said that um, this suggests that maybe seeing rape portrayed in the media as this negative thing and showing the victim and the impact it has on that person and um, the, quant the justified consequences for committing such a thing to a person can be more helpful than, for example, pornography or reality TV, um, where you're getting that objectification kind of glorified or put in a good way. Um, so, to answer the question, I think that having education about rape culture is hugely important to separate that reality um, from entertainment and kind of encouraging the responsible use of sexual violence in media and entertainment and encouraging more if it is used to show it in a negative light, to show the consequences that it has on the victim and to show that this is not acceptable behavior because that is how we're going to create those new values and new beliefs as a society to get rid of the ones that make it okay to do these things. I think that that's a very tough thing, truthfully, because I think we're becoming more and more connected and we're becoming more and more disconnected. So the face-to-face -face contact is much less than it used to be. So it's much easier for me to 
be say something to you online and get away with it and not feel bad about it because guess what? I don't have to look at your face. But face to face, I'm much more likely to be mindful of how I speak and what I say and you know, look at your reactions. Am I offending you? And I think in our society we are really moving away from more face to face contact. And I think this is going to be an issue that continues to evolve. And so it's really important for people to get to know each other and get to know each other with, you know, the people you don't agree with. Mm -hmm. And those are the people that you really want to talk to because that's where understanding happens. Mm -hmm. um, so I think media, I think social media, I mean, I could go on and on. I won't. I'll spare you all from that. But <laughs> I think the goal is for us to really see people face to face, and that's how you're going to understand things. Um, I don't know if that answered the question. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Nathan. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think you have to really bring the education to people. Um, American society has become more lazy when it comes to acquiring knowledge. People don't read. People will accept things on the internet for face value without looking for the reliable sources or backing behind it. So I think you really have to be able to connect with people in a different way because what we're doing right now isn't working. Um, the social media is helping, especially when it comes to the hashtag Me Too movement. So that's a different form, really, and I think that it is having a better impact. More people are uh, comfortable speaking out and whatnot, but I think it's really thinking of new innovative ways to bring the education to people in a different way, more entertaining in a sense, because people like um, entertainment when it comes to education, you know sex sales, uh, violent sales, but you have to come with a different way to move people away from those types of topics and towards educational stuff. That's, that's my opinion. I don't think it's possible to disconnect reality from entertainment because entertainment and technology has become such a prevalent part of our society that it's almost impossible to go a day without looking at a screen at least once, whether it's your phone, your laptop, TV, whatever it is. And because of that, people get so invested in this TV entertainment reality that we tend to forget what's actually going on in our lives. Uh, many TV shows, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of uh, 13 Reasons Why, <clears throat> or have seen the show itself, though the show was not originally made to promote a rape culture, there is a lot in that show that talks about it and talks about the effects of it and then even shows a rape happening. So because people get so invested in TV shows, they tend to forget about what's actually going on and they think that it's entertainment so it's fake, which it is, but in a sense it's not because what's going on in a show could easily happen to anybody anywhere at any time but stuff like that makes us all think that because it's fake in the show it might not actually be happening but a lot of people if you haven't heard it yourself you've seen it catcalling if you can see how disgusting someone can be to your face just imagine how disgusting they can be online I'm sure a lot of people have seen tender fails as well where they show people trying to hit them up and it's gross. I speak from personal experience too, it's gross. <laughs> Dating apps are gross. <laughs> I will leave it at that. <clears throat> what was the original question? Um, how can we disconnect entertainment from reality? Mm -hmm. I agree with the panel. Uh, I don't think that we can. And, uh, we are I mean, I see things as a sociologist, so uh, we're not like consumers of just like this outside entity. We now produce content just as much. So all the, the media that we're talking about is if it's someone else. And I think, actually think it's a little bit destructive, um, the conversations about just the, all the dangers of the me media. Um, we, we create it. The only reason the media gives us this is because we consume it, right? So there's a market. We're the market. We're, we're part of the media, right? So there is no disconnect. Um, we need to start thinking about what makes us consume this, what makes us reproduce it. Um, there's a reason why there's no, there's very few men in the room. And this is always a conversation every time we have discussions about sexual consent or sexual assault. Um, and 
as long as we keep saying that, oh, it's the media, or it's this, it's, it's Nike, or it's um, uh, American Apparel, uh, the less we have to question ourselves and our backgrounds and what we learned is right now. Uh, I just wanted to add something um, in terms of like uh, the media or entertainment and reality. I feel like it's very dependent on where you're from and what your situation is. Uh, so for example, you know, we're growing up in a single mother household. Um, you know, sometimes I had to look to entertainment, the entertainment world to figure out what is it like to be the man of the house and what it means and what you have to do because if these people are, are saying and they're showing me and they're living this great life with everything they ever wanted, maybe I should go in that direction. You know, if they're preaching to me, and you know, especially in, in music and hip hop and rap, especially, you know, for how much I love it, I understand that it also can't be damaging because I know a lot of people personally who look towards that form of entertainment, drugs, violence, or rape, you know, as an escape from the reality of their reality, which is so harsh. So they go into this entertainment and they want to be in it because it could take them away from what they're experiencing at the moment, you know, in their present day lives. Um, but you know, it takes I think that education to let people know, like, hey, this this entertainment is this false reality. It only works there because in the real world, you will, you know, bad things can happen, and it can happen to you, and you can be caught up in this fantasy, and then your life can be damaged, and so can somebody else's. It's surprising to me that a majority of you guys um, agree that there is no disconnect between entertainment and reality, and uh, it makes me wonder, like. Where does the emotional disconnect take place, and like, why can't we disconnect from um, what we see in the media, and like, be able to not use that as a gospel, and be able to, you know, maneuver in our lives in a way that we are more compassionate and empathetic to the people that we are around and we surround ourselves every day with. So it's very interesting to me that that's how the majority of you guys um, perceive this question. Um, so. I don't know if we're going in order anymore, but <laughs> I'm just going to ask a question. Um, do you think that survivors of sexual violence are stigmatized? And do you think that um, they're quietly discouraged from speaking out? Yeah. Oh, yes. I think um, they are very much discouraged um, from speaking out, even on this campus. I've had students who've come in and they have reported and they've been told, you know, this could ruin this person's life. Mm -hmm. And when you're reporting a sexual assault or a rape, that is the last thing that you want to worry about, is that you might be ruining somebody else's life. So yes, I think that there's a lot of shame, there's a lot of guilt, and those are two main things that are barriers for people to report and how they're treated when they do report. I wanted to add something to that too. I think um, <coughs> it's definitely true, um, especially when it comes yeah. to the criminal justice system. So the way the criminal justice system approaches the entire situation where you know um, the woman or the man is afraid of having to go to trial, having to stand in front of a jury, or having to read the constant reports and constantly repeat the same story to 17 different people, um, and the, how long the process takes itself it just, it's very discouraging. It's not, you're not getting um, closure or any relief um, in a sense that's timely. So now you're going through this process, you know, lawyers are involved, cost and uh, fees and all these different things come into play. And I think that's also very discouraging when it comes to those kind of situations where someone may not want to be bothered with it. And just like, you know what, I don't even deal with that because it's too much and it's, you know, it can be humiliating and embarrassing and all of those different things as well. Yeah. I wanted to say something really quickly. Um, I feel like we're all saying a lot of like really positive things, but I think that a lot of people have this disconnect and this misconception that men are the only ones who feed into these kind of stigmas and that men are the only people who feed into this rape culture. Because to me, I think one of the worst things that I see is, and I don't want to say that men, because there are men who are victims and there are men who get raped. Yeah. Um, but what we don't talk about is a lot of women who actually feed into this rape culture and feed into these stigmas against other women. I know that older generations of women, like because we've been conditioned to, like, to believe that we're supposed to have a certain kind of position, we're supposed to fit a certain kind of gender role. Um, so 
we, as like generations go on, we continue to feed that conditioning into our into the later generations. And you know, you're distracting me with this camera so bad. <laughs> <laughs> She's sitting here like in my face. She always speaks truth. Well, no, because I, okay. So really, what I want to say is, I feel like we forget that women as well can feed into this negative perception. Like I know that older generations of women have this like constant perception. Like even my mom, I could say, like is very old fashioned. So a lot of the time, like someone will say something, I've told her a story before, like, oh, you know, like this girl, she said that something happened to her, da, 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 and she'd be like, oh, well, where was she? What was she doing? Da, 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 da. And not that my mom is a bad person, because she's a good person, but that kind of mentality was fed into her so often as a young individual. You know, women have this thing that we're supposed to dress a certain kind of way, or we're supposed to do a certain kind of thing. And so that's why we allow men, in a way, to treat us this way as well. You know, like this whole thing that he was saying about the household is very true, but it's not only men feeding it around, it's women. Right. Women in the household will tell their son, you could do this, you're allowed to do this, but if, a, if their daughter does it, it's wrong. Mm -hmm. a, a, a son can go out and leave and not have any curfew, but their daughter has to be home by 12. Mm -hmm. Because if she's out later than that and something happens to her, it's her fault because she was being a hooch or she was being a slut or she was being whatever. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to say, like, to remind people that as women, we need to make sure that we don't ever want to treat or stigmatize another woman for the way that they act, and we do it all the time. So we feed into it just as much as men do, mm -hmm. you know, especially the way that we talk about each other. Like, you know, you know somebody has sex with, like, a few people, whatever, like, oh, she a hoe. Mm -hmm. Like, why, or, like, if somebody gets raped and they've had a reputation of being a certain kind of way, you automatically assume that she asked for it or she wanted it or whatever. That's, that's wrong, and we're not giving people the benefit of the doubt ever. So like bring this back to like an in the lacy type of point of view, like how um, when as black people we have to kind of um, assimilate or like act in a certain way or a certain manner to like not be treated a certain way by our white counterparts, like when we encounter police or when we go in for a job interview. So like us having to like kind of shift ourselves or code switch, even like as women or men, we have to, men and women and people of color, we all have this similar um, this similar problem when we have to act a certain way or we have to change the way that we would act regularly to assuage other people. Um, Can I add on to what uh, Gahil said? Um, definitely with the family stuff, um, that's very big, especially in urban communities. You have the whole thing of that's family business, don't let it out, don't tell anybody about it, or if right. family members molest or do things to a younger child or other family members, there is a thing of where they don't believe them. Oh no, that didn't happen, they're kind of shamed, and there's that stigma there too to speak out. So that's another uh, impact of the family life that it can have on you too, because you know, it's something that's ingrained since slavery times, definitely, you know? I just have um, a short, Story I'd like to share of something that I witnessed. So first off, I know that anyone of any gender can be raped or sexually assaulted, but I'm going to speak from something I saw that happened to a female friend of mine back home. So over the summer, I was helping her clean out her closet so that she could find things to donate. And she pulled out this one dress of hers and she stared at it for what felt like forever and I asked her if everything was okay. And she said no and threw the dress off to the side. And I don't think anyone really realizes what impact rape can have on someone. And afterwards she picked it right back up, the tears just streaming down her face. She said, this dress is so beautiful, but I can't keep this despite how much I want to and perfect timing, her mother walks downstairs, asks why she's crying, and she says, you already know why I'm crying. Her mother's response was, that happened two months ago, why are you still upset about it? And then her mom said, but you said yes. Um, and then my friend threw the dress at her and screamed, yes, but halfway through, I said no. Mm -hmm. And he kept going. And instead of donating that dress, my friend, burned it in her backyard. So victims are definitely stigmatized and they can be stigmatized by anybody, whether it's society. My friend sadly got 
stigmatized by her own mother, and we all know mothers are supposed to be the empathetic ones who care for you, but it can happen to anyone, and anyone can say something, no matter how much you trust them, and it's a fact that the majority of people who rape, rape someone that they know. It's not as often as you might think that it's a stranger. Just finding someone and raping them, it's always someone, almost always someone that they know because they know how to get them comfortable enough to be around them and then kind of just get them at the last minute. I'm sorry for that. That little that short story, but no, that story definitely um <clears throat> it brings light to what this whole like event is about. Like like you said, she said no halfway. He kept going. People feel like oh, you know, if you give consent in the beginning, that's the consent for the whole night. But consent can change during, after, at the end. So that story just sheds light to what rape culture is. Like you can say no anytime. So thank you for sharing that. I would like to add, I really appreciate that you brought out that all people in the society are responsible for this phenomenon, it's not only men, and I think that's important, but I, I think it's also important to consider a big motive for especially the older generation of women for why they perpetuate those, those ideals, and um, just think about for a moment when you see a car accident, what do you usually think? Oh, I wonder if he was texting. Oh, I bet he was speeding. What was he doing wrong? And I think we try to find blame because we want to tell ourselves, that's not going to happen to me. I drive safely. I don't text and drive. That's not going to happen to me. And I think women of that generation at a time where rape culture was more prominent and was definitely, you know, hush hush, you don't talk about it, it happened more frequently, they would tell themselves, well, it's not going to happen to me because I don't do those things. And if I make sure my daughter's not doing those things, it's not going to happen to her. And I think it was really fear motivated because women of that time probably felt like they had a lot less control over the situation. They weren't having meetings like this on college campuses to talk and raise awareness about it. And I think that may also be ingrained in them, that, that powerlessness over if someone wants to rape you, that's going to happen. So you know, let's do everything that we can to, to prevent it. And we put a lot of the responsibility on victims, on potential victims, and not enough responsibility on people who perpetrate such actions. I'm sorry. I was just going to add something. So I, I like what Danielle said. Um, I don't think that you were trying to lay blame on someone else. I don't think that's what you were saying. The wider discussion, though, is has to be how these things continue to exist. The, the rate of sexual assault, despite ample resources to universities to stop it, has remained constant, at least, over time. Um, but we should start to talk about other infrastructures of power and how they're all related. We have to complicate this before we can simplify it. Mm -hmm. Like now, we don't know. We don't. We don't talk about um, LGBTQ violence. We don't talk about um, men being raped. And we know. We know. We have statistics to show uh, the Bureau of Justice Statistics. Um, women that are in college are sexually assaulted at a lower rate than those same age outside the university. It's pretty similar, despite all those resources, but we don't talk about um, men are 78% more likely to be raped in college campuses. And the reason why I'm talking about that is not to shift the discussion, is that because these um, master narratives start to, sorry? I think that is the discussion, men being raped as well. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I'm, yes. <laughs> but the discussion, whenever we start a discussion, it takes over everything else. Um, there's so many things related to power here. For example, uh, uh, African-American men make up 6% of college campuses, but they're accused for sexual assault at 27%. We, like the, the introduction, the intersectionality of all these different things, um, all these different systems that are next to each other, that we need to start looking at how these are related to each other, how they, they build upon each other. And, um, and again, I know that it makes it, it makes it harder to discuss. The more we complicate, the more other issues we bring in, we feel powerless, we feel defeated, it's, it's difficult, but um, we can't just isolate it and just pretend that we can solve it that way. Can I add to like a flip side of the stigma when it comes to men? Definitely so. Um, whenever, so this happened to me, actually. So there was a young lady that I wasn't attracted to, with not a preference, whatever. But I told her in a polite way that I wasn't interested, and she said, oh, you must be gay. 
that's also adding into the whole stigma of reporting stuff or even with men feeling a certain way of speaking about rape and their situation. So that's something you gotta think about too, you know. It goes both ways, Re rejection. You know, you have to be able to accept it, men and women. So just a little statistic that I saw way back when. Um, it was a picture of like the, the sign that you see in a woman's bathroom. It showed a hundred of them. And then it said, of these 100 women, 27 of them will be raped. But uh, yeah, 27 of them will be raped. Um, like 15 of them will report it. Justice will only be done for three. Thank you. Do you want to add a question again? Um, yeah, just to give up the last question. Uh, based off everything we've spoken about and the examples we've discussed, what actions or advice would you give someone if you would witness them perpetuating rape culture, like the grabbing of the arm or the, um, and even athletics too, like the slapping of the ass, like what would you do to bring awareness that this is perpetuating rape culture, even if it's normalized? We asked the age-old question, what if they did it back to you? Because, as she said, slapping on the ass. If you, our coach, slapped one of your players on the ass, how would you feel if the player just came back and hit you back? Probably feel a little weird. Just ask, just think. If someone did the same thing to you, how would you feel? Ask them that question, or and see how they react. Most likely in shock. What if the person say it's okay because it's normal to them? Just spill some facts. <laughs> <laughs> that's consent then. Where they can be consent if somebody says like that's okay? But yeah, but then it gets to the point where they feel comfortable to do that to anyone past athleticism. So that's when you have to let them know the knowledge like, okay, you're okay with your coach doing this, but you need to understand that outside, I guess, your locker room, that's not okay. Even though it's normalized, it's not okay. Because then if you just say, oh, it's consent, and you don't tell them, they have no knowledge of their professional needs. Just because it's okay for you doesn't mean it's okay for someone else. Mm -hmm. That's like the N word. Like, when somebody's like, my friends have to say it, okay? So I'll say it to your friend. <laughs> like, it's not for everybody. <laughs> And I think, too, it's a tough conversation to have, but you need to check it right then and there um, because things snowball. If it's left to left unchecked and the uh, behaviors are allowed to continue, it's just going to get worse and worse and worse, with, and they'll think there's no consequence to their actions. So I think, you know, it's a hard conversation to have, but ultimately it's the right thing. Check it, and I promise you, once you start speaking up about things that are wrong in life, you'll feel better, you have a better quality of life, et cetera, and people will respect you more. If they don't respect it, if they have a different response that's not uh, receptive, that's a sign that you don't need them around you. And so. Yeah. Just to add. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, just to add like a small thing onto that, um, I just thought, I guess you could call it um, situational consent. It's like so, it's okay for your friends or family to do this, but someone you don't know, it's not okay for them to do this. Like, it's okay if like one of your family members or your friends just comes up to you and grabs you into a hug, but if someone you don't know does that, that's a little weird. So just situational consent, leave it at that. Um, yeah, uh, kind of touch on what Taryn said, like those conversations can be really difficult, um, especially when we, Consider the social stigma on college campuses, right? Like, um, I know we were talking about stigmatizing earlier, but there's, there can be such a stigma, especially in a social group. Um, they, I, I mean, you have to nip that in the bud because, at, at least to me and to, um, I, I'm gonna hark back to that pyramid resource that Jamie provided. It, it is based on escalating behaviors, right? Um, so I, I think we have to call out when we see it. I wish that uh, Sandra uh, GOS, our assistant dean of students, could be here because one thing she talks about a lot um, is us being Facebook woke. We'll get up behind the screen and then we'll call it out later, or we'll be we'll be supportive of these movements on the front end. Um, but then we're bystanders when it actually happens. Um, 
things, and we have to work through that and get better about calling things out when we see it. And I agree with Dr. Nawabi. This is not an easy. This is not a black and white. This is not an easy issue to solve. It's extremely complicated. There are a lot of different forces at play, power dynamics. It's a very intersectional issue. But I find that with issues like this, people get very overwhelmed. They don't know where to start, and then they're like, "Forget it. I'm not doing anything." And something in counseling, you know, that I'll tell students is that you can't change other people's opinions. You can't change people's thoughts in their minds. You can't make them change, but you can change yourself. And what ends up happening is they have to change in response to you. So if we're all out there, we're making these changes in our own lives, and we're being our own advocates in even small ways. Like, this does not have to happen on a massive scale. You know, some people feel like, oh, well, I need to be out there and do a march, or I need to be out there and do this. You can do it on these very basic levels, and that can create, like, that builds up, it's cumulative builds up and makes change. So don't feel overwhelmed, even though it's a pretty overwhelming and big issue. There are things that you can do every day in your life to make a difference. Okay. Gabe, do you yeah, have a question? Yeah, uh, so, you know, looking at that question as a man, like for me, just thinking about it right now, it's very difficult to try, like, especially if I'm with my boys and, you know, they grab, you know, go on the street, you know, just chilling and, you know, maybe they can't pull somebody or you know they grab somebody by the arm just for me to say something at that moment would be very difficult because then I know at that moment when I say something they're gonna look at me and think something and they're gonna say something back and you know it's a tough conversation to have but a conversation that's needed you know just to I'm just letting you know you know whether you take it or not that's on you but I'm letting you know what I know and how I feel about it and what I think society should feel about it right. and going back to like sports uh, you know, I played baseball in high school and I boxed for a little bit. And smacking somebody on the backside was just the norm. It was like, you know, smacking the backside, you know, strike him out, got it, coach. You know, like, peg on the backside, knock him out, got it, coach. You know, like, it was just something, because it, it meant something. You know, it was kind of like a bond. And your coach was doing it. No one else, you know, the other coach wasn't doing it to you. No other players were doing it to you. It, it like, signified, like, a bond. In, in a weird way, when you think about it now. Um, but that was, that was just the culture. So that's another situation of the situational consent. Right, and, and the culture, because if you go to a baseball team, you know, try to explain to them why they shouldn't do that and what it could lead to, I feel like they're going to have a hard time accepting it because that's just the culture of the sport. Right. You know, like even professional players on TV, they do it all the time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if, I, if I'm a high school baseball player and I see professionals doing it, why can't I do it? I think it's easier to have those conversations on a one-on-one -on -one because when you address people in a crowd, they feel like they're, some, they're watching and there's attention that they're going to be played out and whatnot. So it's always easier to approach on a one-on-one -on -one as a perspective you know, when it comes to that. So the confrontational is actually just a bit much when it's in like a group setting, but when you actually get in a more intimate environment, it's better to combat those type of um, emotions and situations. So that was, yeah. One yeah one I think no matter like who you're addressing to group as an individual, it's important to talk to them in a way that we're speaking to each other right now because this is a very um, emotionally charged issue and a lot of people are passionate about it and, and they, they have a strong reaction when they see rape culture being perpetuated and that comes out when you're trying to communicate with that person and it may come out as aggressive or like you're attacking the person and just on a straight communication level, People will not listen to you if they feel attacked, if they feel that you're emotionally charged. They may discredit what you're saying, even if you're making valid points because you sound erratic or you sound aggressive. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important to kind of check how you're communicating with that person and try to speak to them with respect and as an equal because this is that's what this is all about. It's about respecting other human beings and treating everybody the way that a human should be treated. So let's kind of remember that when you do it's such a great point. Thank you guys so much. Um, can we give our panelists a round of applause? <laughs> and then our hosts, the round of applause. So um, for the last 10 minutes, I was going to leave it up to you guys to open up questions to the panelists that you have of your own. Um, if anybody wants to jump ahead, they can get started with that. No All right. Oh, go ahead. I did have a question because Professor Nawani said something about 
how it's more like it's a bigger issue and how kind of the way that I kind of was trying to like follow what you were saying about how our institutions kind of set this ourselves up for I guess failures kind of what you were saying I wanted you to like elaborate on that yeah sure uh, so I, I'm good about the kind of consent I mean one of the major conclusions is gonna uh, the old school way of thinking was that we, we give people the tools of consent and they will use it they can use it we can empower people but one of the issues with that is that consent assumes that power is equal. It assumes that um, men and women are equal, that men and men are equal, that uh, all racial groups are equal. And all these things, um, all these things are not considered sometimes when we discuss and we educate students. Um, and when I was saying we're invested, uh, we have our economy is built into uh, patriarchy and, and built into toxic masculinity. We buy, watch football every Sunday, and we we um, we glorify violence, and we glorify we go to the movies and watch. We don't go watch the the new documentary. We don't watch the the, the um, hunting grounds, the documentary. We go and watch the new James Bond film, right? Um, we we are invested in it, and so you know one of the things that I had to think about later on in my life, and why I teach about these, some of these things, is that. I was part of that when I was growing up. The same, my friends were, I was the same way. I played sports, I, I perpetuated rape culture. I, I did. And so now as an educator, I have power and I can use that to try to talk to men about it, right? I didn't have one conversation growing up with other men about consent, about sexual assault, zero, it's zero. And we have conversations about this like in public, but with the people that we have the most influence over and have the most influence over us, we don't. And um, I, just let, I come in because you said that, because you talked about how um, women are part of it and men are part of it. And we're all wrapped up in this, uh, perpetuating it together. And if we don't understand it as this is us together, that you have responsibility and I have responsibility, then we're not gonna get very far. Mm -hmm. well, is that a tip on how to approach uh, tough conversations too? This is a technique that I've used for what's going on in my life currently. Whenever I'm having a conversation with someone, I tell them to listen to understand, not to respond. So I tell them to listen to what I'm um, saying, think about the response three seconds before they actually speak to ensure that they got what we're talking about and that they're on the same point and that it's not out of line, you know? So that's something that you can use to approach these tough conversations. Um, going back to that institutional question, um, I, Christmas time, holiday season, um, you know, there's lots of kids toys if you go to any store. And I work at the Dollar General. If I walk down the aisle, you can see the boys section and the girls section. In the boys section, there are trucks, there's building blocks, there's all these tools to teach boys how to be useful, to teach them how to accomplish things. You go five feet over to the girls section, you have uh, baby dolls, you have makeup, you have uh, nail polish kits which is teaching females how to look pretty. So the boys are being taught that they have potential, they have skills, the women for the young girls are being taught, you are made to be pretty. And that totally has a, a shift in that. I think that's very institutional. And I think we like seeing little girls all dressed up in their heels and their mom's pearls. And we like seeing little boys in the mud playing with the trucks, building things, you know? And I think that's institutionalized. That and we, we view it as very innocent. We're like, oh, look at her, trying to be like her mom. And we're not seeing that we're raising them to view themselves as having very different purposes from an early age. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is, like, how do you form an opinion when there are, like, two sides to a story? Kind of like thinking about how, um, so my issue is kind of like with the, Bill Cosby case and while as much as I want to be like you know he should be free you know like he's I feel like they're bringing another black man down um, who's done so much for the community but then you're also like uh, the women you know like as women it's hard to speak up so the fact that it took them maybe 20 years to finally speak up isn't a wrong thing but then like there are all these like issues with like what side how do you like deal with like those two clashing like clashing opinions when it's like certain things that you relate to or like um, and things like that kind of. Well, I think the only people who can know what happened are the people who were there. And I think we can't really form an opinion of what happened. We can form an opinion um, based 
based on hypotheticals or based on how we see the person candling. We can only judge what we see. We can't assume or uh, attribute blame or say who's wrong and who's right because that's something that we don't know. So we can just look at the responses and, and evaluate what we're seeing right now. But I think it's okay that you feel that way. It's a very complicated situation and there's you know, a lot of information both pro and against. So I think it's normal in these situations where you're, you have an emotional reaction to something and then you have, you're trying to logically kind of reason through it and then you have this other emotional reaction, you're trying to manage all of it. It's not easy. So I think you have to give yourselves the space to feel confused about it and to keep thinking about it, to keep looking at it and figuring out why maybe you have some bias. Maybe why are you, we all have bias, unconscious bias and everywhere. So, you know, giving yourself the space to feel that way and the time to kind of figure out how it all works for you. Any more questions? Go ahead, Emily. So, considering the fact that um, rape culture is so undereducated and um, a lot of people perpetuate rape culture without even being conscious of it, how do you think that we can use platforms like social media or even just, you know, being in school like this, how do you think that we can um, start using those type of platforms to eradicate the problem? Shane's cluck, but um, I actually have my real talk session. I'm doing uh, just that, talking about great culture, be, being a former fuck boy, in a sense, <laughs> and how I changed my ways and evolved. I think it's really not being afraid to put those conversations out because they're not normal conversations. They need to occur. We need to normalize these conversations so that they can see that these actions are wrong. If they keep seeing these repeated uh, messages, then subliminally it'll stick, hopefully. But you gotta keep talking and speaking, you know? It's good to go ahead and use the hashtags and whatnot, but you know, really try, be a driving force to the changes you wanna see, you know? You can't depend on the next person. You gotta make it happen for yourself. You know, it's kind of like with your common core education. You worked all day on the same problems and you went home at night and you did the same thing. Like you're doing the same thing over and over. You just keep, you keep having a conversation everywhere and you keep talking about it. You keep bringing it up from a bunch of different angles. Make it intersectional. Bring in the LGBTQ community. Bring in the African American community, the Asian community, and talk about it and talk about it a lot. I think I'm more, more trying to, I mean, I'm more so trying to get at, like, how can we, like, change the platform of social media from being, like, more of a um, entertaining space to a place where people can actually seek, like, feasible or, like, viable knowledge and, um, like, because I feel like things like Twitter, Instagram are used to um, perpetuate rape culture because they kind of, you know, use it as, like, a joke or whatever the case is. Like, why can't we you know, shift the conversation to be something more productive, like rape culture, like educating, you know, educating on. I, uh, that's a great question. I, I'm not sure who said it, but um, when we were discussing how uh, media, uh, we're, as consumers, we're the ones who are changing what the media uh, is. So as consumers of Twitter, Instagram, we're, depict, we're determining what is popularized, how many likes are, is it getting. That's what makes something popular and go viral. So I think on an individual level, just feeding more energy and attention into these things that you're talking about, about um, having open discussions, about raising awareness, um, feeding energy into that. And if you see something that is perpetuating rape culture, not giving it the attention that it needs to, to thrive and go viral. And I'm not saying condone it or accept it as something that's okay, but um, you know, when we see advertisements like this, when we hear um, blurred lines, you know, switch the channel on the radio. If that song is not getting hits on the radio, they're gonna take it right off. That's, we're, we're the determinants of what is going on in the mass media. And it, it happens at the very individual level which each decision that you're making. And, uh, and also, you know, about social media, you know, I would say to try and educate as much as you can on social media, you know, to keep posting, keep going, because for each post, that can educate somebody about rape culture, there's three to four posts promoting it, you know, and, and it's just saturated, you know, social, social media is saturated with, with such, you know, toxic posts and, and memes and, and 
you know, just people who use Twitter and Instagram as a place to spread hate and then, you know, make money off of it. And I think we should put more emphasis on Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat looking out for that and trying to stop it, or if it's there, to take it down. Um, because at the end of the day, it's about money and it's about how many people are using it and if they see that we are not happy with it and we stop using it and we stop going to it, they will they will do their best to make sure it's not there anymore. You know, at the end of the day, for these companies, it's a dollar amount and if we you know, express our you know, distaste for what they're allowed to be posted, they, they will do something about it. Uh, so wanted to respond to them too about the whole social media thing. It's also kind of what you put into it. Because I don't know the exact word for it, but I know that there's a mechanism. If you notice, whatever you like and whatever you feed into on social media is what comes up on your page. Mm -hmm. Whatever you start to, like, let's say you're an ultra liberal, right? And you hate Donald Trump, whatever. I'm not, I'm just saying, it's an example. Whatever you like, all those types of posts, there's a mechanism on those websites that it's going to start to pop up stuff that you like on purpose. Mm -hmm. So it really depends on what you put into it and what you feed into it. If you constantly are looking up stupid things on the shade room and watching how whoever's pregnant with whoever's kid and looking at the comments, you're going to see negativity. You're going to see things that are perpetuating negativity and the things that you don't want to see. But if you put out, if you start following things that you want that are positive, that you are promoting the things that you are passionate about, that's what you're going to receive in return. And it also is about, like they're saying, educating, like using those type of different pages. One person who sees your post, two, three, whatever, there's going to be, let's say 100 people see your post, there's going to be one person that's like, dang, she was speaking facts, and repost it. And then another one, and another one. So the same chain reaction that those other negative posts get can be the same thing that yours get. Mm -hmm. So it's not only about, like, look what you want to see, but also putting that out there, too. You have that power. Like, we are all the consumers. We all feed into this, all the stuff that we listen to. We feed into the hip-hop music that talks badly about women and all that stuff. We feed into it. So we could be the same people that put out that positive, like, the positive things that we want to see. Right. And it's not only about education, but it's also ap applying that into your day-to-day -day life. As much as you can, we can have these conversations, it needs to be that one person that actually changes the chain reaction, like Gabe said, like, in your friend group. Gabe can have this conversation with us a million times, but if his friend goes around and cat calls a girl and he doesn't say anything, he's perpetuating the same thing that we were just talking about for an hour. Mm -hmm. So we need to learn how to not only talk about it, but apply it in our life. So, yeah, Thank you. sorry. Okay, go ahead. Sorry, we're reaching time, and I kind of want to just go over some strategies that um, I looked up that actually were outside of just social media. So, um, <laughs> All right, so the first one was named the real problem. Um, violent masculinity and victim blaming, these are both two cornerstone, cornerstones of rape culture and they go hand in hand. Um, number two, re-examine and reimagine masculinity. Is masculinity inherently um, considered violent? Three, get enthusiastic about enthusiastic consent. Enthusiastic consent is the idea that we are all responsible to make sure that our partners are active in whatever we're going down, whatever's going down sexually. Four was get media illiterate. Media, like everything else we consume, is a product. Someone imagined and created it and implemented it. Ask right questions of who created the media that you're watching and who profits off of the objectification of women and men. Globalize your awareness of rape culture. Look at Google stra strategies like creating monumentums for the U.S. to ratify the global convention of elimination of violence against women and certain platforms like that. Six, know your history because for all those who live in the U.S. here, we must acknowledge and learn that the US, U.S.'s long history of state sanctioned is uh, surrounded around violence. Um, take an intersectionality approach, intersectional approach. Facebook is on board. <laughs> um, practice real politics. You may be crystal clear about your own rejection of rape culture, but when someone you know calls a woman a slut, approach him or her from a place of empathy. Try to tell them you know that they probably don't mean no harm, but you're concerned that they might be doing something in some other way, and explain why, and only be patient when they reply. Um, and then the last one, lobby your community. Rape culture thrives in a passive acceptance of female degradation, also in male degradation. Victim blaming, hyper masculinity in our
communities, both physical and digital. If you see something on Facebook, report it. Lobby, um, lobby your culture, your culture. Lobby college administrators for more safe places to discuss sexual assault on campuses and do more around your environment. Thank you. <laughs>